The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. We're back live. That's right. Uh, Traven and I took a couple of a days away and we played some oldies but goodies, but we are back live and I'm glad to be here. Uh, missed you, but man, did I enjoy having some unfettered time off that everybody needs that from time to time, right? And hopefully we all survived that. Uh, thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be here with you. We're going to be with you for the next hour talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. Uh, we're trying to help you with information and inspiration. That's really the mission here at Autism Live, information and inspiration. Uh, and by the way, that goes for the entire autism community. And when I, and I'm talking about the bigger, larger autism community, of course, that starts with individuals who are on the autism spectrum, but then we include everyone who loves those individuals because that truly is the community to me. Um, and that that community is big and beautiful and talented um, and capable of doing so much if we can figure out some things that we agree upon, right? We're never gonna agree on all things because uh, everybody's different and everybody's story is different and everybody's journey is different, but, I think we can all agree that individuals on the autism uh, spectrum deserve dignity, respect, employment, housing, support when necessary, right? Consideration um, and a place at the table as our friend Joanne Laura always used to say. So I think we can all agree on those things. And if we can, then we can move forward and figure out what we need individually while we're moving in that direction as a community. So good morning, Raquel. Uh, so glad that you're here with us this morning, which brings me to the fact that you guys can be writing in and have your voice heard. This show is collaborative. We love to hear from you guys. We love to know what your thoughts are, your questions, your concerns. We love to chat. That's what we love to do. So there are many different ways that you can connect with us here. One of them is our homepage, autism-live.com. I'm not able to get the live feature working yet this morning, but I haven't given up hope on that. Normally, there is a place where you can chat with us directly on that page, but a lot of you prefer to chat with us on, on Facebook Live or on YouTube, and we certainly love, 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 love talking to you on those places. Uh, don't forget, you can be watching us live there too. Don't forget, you can also watch us live on Twitter and Periscope, and that we podcast to many different places, including iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Deezer. I do like to point out to you that our show is free in all the places that we put it, and we are, you know, commercial free. There are times we used to when we would do the show in the studio where we would play you sort of interstitial, sometimes um, commercials for things that we talk about here on the show, but uh, we're largely commercial free. And um, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, how, how are they doing this, right? We do have um, sponsors that underwrite us and, and that's really, really important to us. But the only reason why they underwrite us is if we're reaching families, because that's what they want us to do. So every view that you uh, watch us or that you encourage other people to watch us ensures that we're on the air. And now during these difficult times, that's never more important than ever. So uh, it's more important than ever. I don't know what I just said. My mouth is on vacation still. So um, I wanna encourage you to watch the show when it's appropriate for you, but to share it. You know, our friend Danny Bowman says sharing is caring. So <laughs> please share the show in whatever way is comfor comfortable to you on Facebook, on YouTube. You can also like us on Facebook, that counts for things, and subscribe to us on YouTube. That also 
all of that aggregate keeps us on the year. We've been on the year now for nine years. So we appreciate uh, you guys being here with us and letting other people know. We don't have a marketing budget. Let me be very clear. You, you know, if you've seen an ad for Autism Live, I, I, can't, I can't claim it. I don't know who did it. I think twice we've done little Facebook ads, twice in nine years. So please um, be our marketing people for us and get the word out because uh, we think that we've got something useful to a lot of people, um, but if they don't find it, you know, it's that tree in the forest thing, right? Uh, I do like to remind you at the start of the show that we have lots of experts on the show, and I'm really excited about the expert that we have on Mondays, usually on Mondays, and we have her today. Bonnie Yates is going to be joining us in a few minutes. But uh, we have experts all week long, but I just don't want you to confuse me as one of the experts. Yes, I'm your host, and I my credentials are that I am a, a former teacher, and once a teacher, always a teacher, and um, I have a beautiful, wonderful, talented child who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. So I have a vested interest in this community, right? Um, and, you know, uh, that, that's really why I'm here because I got the help and support that I needed. So he got the help and support that he needed and his life is rich and full and my life is rich and full. So I have some karmic debt to pay down. So I want to help you, um, but I'm not an expert. But, you know, right in, and I, I like to say that I have an informed opinion because I've interviewed a lot of people. I would venture to say I've interviewed more people about autism probably than anybody else in the world. So, you know, I've picked up a little information along the way, but not an expert. Okay. Informed opinion. Care about you. Yes. Expert. No. All right. Um, but we really love it when you guys write in. We absolutely do. Which brings me to my next thing. Uh, I was so loved on Saturday night while I was in the middle of something that was really frustrating the, the bewatsits out of me. Um, <laughs> somebody wrote to me and on Facebook and said, I just want to thank you so much for the jargon of the day and how much it's helping them while they're in school to be able to understand these terms. And it just made my entire evening. So uh, on Mondays, three days a week, we like to do the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, we try to figure out what in the hey nani nani are the experts talking about? What does it have to do with us? Do we really need to learn this term? And often the answer is yes. Right. So what we do here is we give you um, first, we give you the actual definition, which often we make fun of because that's really all there is to do, because uh, otherwise it's useless. And then we give you a working definition and hopefully some examples. And sometimes you still won't get it. And I don't ever want you to beat yourself up about that. We've all been there. Right. But eventually, you know, the concept of it is sort of there. It's like an earworm and you're like, I don't really know what that is, but eventually you're going to see it and, and what, you know, you'll put it all together and you'll go, oh, I get it. And then you'll turn to the dark side and start using the term too. It can't be helped. You stick around long enough, it happens. Uh, but that's, that's why we do this. Now, the irony of all of this is that we started doing this because we couldn't understand what the experts were saying. So here's the hilarity of it. You, apparently, even the experts couldn't understand themselves. So the experts are telling their students to come here to watch the jargon so that they can hear it explained in a way that will make sense to them and get the parent perspective on it. Now, that makes me happy. Uh, that's like, you know, bucket list check. Um, but it also, I want to stay true to what it was in the beginning. It's for parents and people on the spectrum who are like, I don't get what they're talking about. Right. So, uh, today's a good one. Cause I bet you that it's going to be easy to understand. So we won't make as much fun of it, but, um, you're going to hear these, especially as we start gearing up to go back to school, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today on the show um, it's going to be more important than ever that we're talking about the services, right? And this is one of the services that you're going to get offered through your school district. You should anyway, SLP. Um, it's not somebody's initials. It's very close to being my initials, but it's not. Uh, so, so let's take a look at what our actual definition of SLP, what does SLP stand for? Of course, it's a speech and language pathologist. 
Okay, great. But if you don't know, if you've never met a speech and language pathologist before, you're no closer to knowing like, okay, great. What does that got to do with autism? And what, you know, what will a speech and language pathologist do? So let's go ahead and look at our working definition to see what, who these folks are. This is a person who works on speech production, articulation, and social communication. Um, and this is super important that we understand these different um, categories of what an SLP does, because some of them have strength in two and not as much in the third one. And you wanna make sure that you have somebody who's working on all three of these things. So, and these things are vital. I, I want you to know that I have so much respect for SLPs and for an SLPs space on an autism team. I really, really do. But in a second, we're gonna talk about what an SLP doesn't do, okay? So speech production is super important because if we have kiddos that um, they have not been speaking and um, therefore speaking is not reinforcing to them, right? And you know, if you watch the show, we talk a lot about one of the first early things that we do is we try to get the child to mand so that they're requesting something. So the child before, the child came out of the womb and they wanted a drink, milk, water, juice, they would, ah! and you'd shove a bottle in their face, right? That was the way they communicated. And then for a typically developing kid, they start to say, whoa, you know, to say water, right? And it takes them like two years to be able to say water because they don't have the facial muscles. They don't have the tongue muscle to be able to say water and be able to be understood. Now for our kiddos on the autism spectrum, they might've bypassed that whole thing and they didn't work on those facial muscles and they didn't say wah wah, right? Or, or we didn't understand what they were asking for or they weren't asking for it, whatever. So what we often end up with is a kid who's three, four or five and we're starting to work on speech and getting them to request and they start to request things but nobody understands them or mom understands, but she's the only person or dad or, you know, the nanny understands, but nobody else understands because we don't have the, the, the musculature to be able to pronounce the sounds and to do the articulation to say water, right? Because if you have a five-year-old who says, wah, 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 you know, people aren't going to understand that that means water, only the people closest to them. So it's super important that we're working on these things um, with our kids, right? But then there's the third piece, which is social communication. Because so often I will hear from families and they'll go, you know, how do I get to conversation? Um, my child can talk now. It's funny, I wished and wished and wished for my child to talk. Well, my child can talk now and he can say, want car and want juice. But how do I get to conversation? The speech and language pathologist person can hold up a card and he can say, you know, look at the picture and he can say card uh, or car uh, if it's a picture of a car. But, you know, how do I get him to say to me, I want a red car? What kind of car do you want? Um, now, that's all under the heading of social communication as far as an SLP is concerned. And you can get them to work on it, but you need to be asking them to work on it. Sometimes they'll, you know, they'll say, oh, well, we're working on pragmatics, pragmatic language, but definitely talk to your SLP about this portion of the program, because um, there are some great SLPs out there that can help to, along with a really good ABA program, they can help to pull that language into a place where it's age appropriate. But I want to say this with love and uh, respect that if you have a child who's not talking and going to an SLP and saying they're going to take care of this end to end, I got to tell you, you need a hug because A, they can't. Um, there are lots of things about speech that your child is going to have to learn that are not under the heading of what an SLP does. Okay. But secondly, you're never going to get the funding level for an SLP to, to get your child to where you want them to go because of what I just said. They don't have that bag of tricks to do the whole thing by themselves, okay? So what you want, if you're going for speech, the ideal is that you, especially if you've got a young child who is not yet at school, you want to be doing a 40-hour ABA program 
with an SLP doing additional time. It might be an hour or two a week. And if you can, I mean, my preference is always get the 40 hour and fight to get the SLP on top of that. That's the, that's the creme de la creme. You are guaranteeing that your child is being able to make the most progress that they possibly can with speech if you do that. If it becomes a trade-off and you're like, I can, I, there, you know, there are some funders who will say we won't fund more than 40 hours a week. I don't know where they came up with that arbitrarily. Um, because really every waking hour of your child's time should be um, educational, right? But they go, well, you know, that's where they draw the line and they go, it's just too much for a child, uh, which is hilarious because we all used to say that. I used to say that. I was like, 40 hours, he's too little. The truth of the matter is, is that a typical three-year-old is learning all the time. Their entire world is a classroom because they're soaking it all in. For our kids, we have to make it a little bit more directed, but it's still got to be a classroom all the time. So um, if you really can't, if they won't go over 40 hours, and if your ABA provider says, look, we can only give you therapists for 38 hours, then yes, take the other two hours and do the speech and language pathologist for the week. But if you had a choice at three for doing 40 hours of uh, ABA or 38, I would do 40. And here's why. A lot of times the stuff that the SLP does really well comes in handy later. And you're definitely gonna get the SLP when your child goes to kindergarten. So I would rather work on all the things that the ABA does at three, because they will work on some of this with your child also and then continue with the SLP at school age. That's only if you can't do both. I would do both if you can, but if you can't, I would prioritize ABA. Uh, thanks, somebody says, I think it's great to have jargon of the day. It helps me to explain things to the parents of my students in layman's terms. Woohoo! we love that. So there you go, SLP, very important person on the team. Very important. All right, moving on. We always have a question of the day for you. And our question today is what's the hardest part of your day? And I got a reason why I'm asking that because um, sometimes we just suffer through it, right? We're like, oh, I, I know I've told this story before on the show where the hardest part of the day for me was getting my child out of the freaking car. And, you know, uh, it mostly it was getting him out of the car when it was, we were coming home from school and we were living in a condo that was on a very busy street and there was never any parking. So I had to park on the street with cars flying by. It took, it took a kid being hit by a car before they put in a speed bump. So it literally was like a life and death issue to me. And my child would dilly dally and not get out of the car. And I'd be like, one of us is going to get hit by a car. And it was the whole getting the backpack and so on and so forth. And I was just suffering through it and having the, the lining of my stomach eaten every day it was like walking through the lion's den with my child every day. And I finally, duh, said something to our ABA team and said, you know, this is the hardest part of my day. And they were like, oh, well, let's work on it. <laughs> oh, let's work on it. And what was amazing was they worked on it with me first and said, okay, tell us what's going on. Show us what's going on. Let's pick a time when it's not busy outside um, and, and show us exactly what's going on and what the sequence is. And so they changed my sequence just a smidge, right? Um, and they had me, uh, one of the things was like, oh my gosh, how silly am I? They had me put his backpack on the other side of the car, not on the same side of the car as him, because I was trying to get him and him to get his backpack out of the same side of the car. And so instead they had, you know, so driver's side, I've got to get out of the car first, right? And, and so I'm watching for the traffic and then I would open the door, get him out, walk him to the sidewalk and then I would open the passenger door and he would get the backpack out of the passenger door. Solved the problem. So, and I, I had done it the other way for six months, putting our lives in jeopardy, right? So I'm asking you, what's the hardest part of your day? And maybe let's like take a look at it and see if we can't winnow it down with a fresh set of eyes that isn't you and doesn't have all the stress from it and figure out, can we fix this? Now, if you have 
if you are lucky enough to have an ABA team working with you, I just encourage you right now, open an email and send your supervisor an email about the hardest part of your day and say, hey, I was just thinking about this. Do you know what the hardest part of my day is? When he goes to bed and I can't get rest and he gets up a million times. Can we work on this? Like, boom, change your life right here, right now. Right? <laughs> How exciting would that be? If you don't have the benefit of working with an ABA team, I would encourage you to like open an email and reach out to somebody and say, I need ABA. Um, but we can talk about what the hardest part of your day is here and, and try to figure it out ourselves and figure out how can we make it easier? Because I guarantee you, whatever the hardest part of your day is could be better. I'm not saying it would be hearts, flowers, roses, and like, poof, it's, you know, bink, uh, and it's all automatically better, um, like all better, but it can be better than it is right now. I guarantee you. I guarantee you, but we got to take it, we got to take it, look at it, open it up, shed a, a little light on it, and then take it apart a little bit, and then it will be better. Okay, so we're going to be talking about that uh, from time to time throughout this week, and uh, we always have a topic for the week, and so our topic for the week, dun, 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 dun. I don't remember what it is, Traven, so I got to wait for you. Admitting when something isn't working, of course. I don't know about you, but this is one of the hardest things in the world for me. I, um, I once went to a conference and somebody was giving a talk about how we are creatures of habit and how we will keep doing something. And they mentioned the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting it, excuse me, expecting a different result, which I've heard, like I've heard that. It doesn't apply to me. I don't know what you're talking about, right? Um, but then somebody put it in different words and um, the speaker said, have you ever looked at the, the window ledge inside your house of a screened window? Um, and do you see, you know, what, what's there? Um, that often there's like one or two dead flies um, just inside your windowsill where there's a screen. And he said, do you ever think about why that is? And he said, because, you know, they've done studies on this. And what it is, is that the fly can see the outside. Um, it doesn't understand the screen. And so it sticks by the screen and it keeps flying at the screen, thinking eventually I'm going to get through that screen. <clears throat> and it dies. It dies right there at the screen, trying to get out, never once turning around and looking and going, oh, look, there's a whole room that I could be flying around in and occasionally people open a door. But they die there on the windowsill. And the truth of the matter, I'm guilty of this. Like I, just like me with the car and getting out of the car, it's just like, I just kept doing it that way and going, this is horrible, right? <laughs> Instead of going, okay, this is not working. Um, what could I possibly do that's different? And, and I, listen, it wouldn't have mattered. I couldn't have gotten to it on my own. Um, it just wouldn't have occurred to me. I was that entrenched in what I was doing. But what I did do differently is that I mentioned it to somebody else. I don't even know that I was looking for help when I did it. I just said, oh, I just, I hate it when we get out of the car. Like I wanted to move. And I, and I wanted to move for many reasons, but I just was blaming it on that. I was like, I hate this condo and I hate that we live here um, because of this one little incident. I mean, there were other things too, why I hated that condo. But um, the first step is admitting that something isn't working. And, and, and there's no shame in that of going, okay, this isn't working. And it could be something small, or it could be something big. I don't know about you, but so many times during this COVID thing, while we're all home and, and spending all this time at home, you know, we've had to revamp how our house is set up. And, and our house looks significantly different than when we started this because it had to work. And it wasn't working for us with the things that we need to do at home. And then every time something new gets added, like my son um, started taking some classes online. Some of the things that we recommended a couple of weeks ago, he took one of the classes at the Theatricum Botanicum. And um, it meant that our house had to work differently for an hour and a half a day. 
and that we had to have, you know, cameras with, uh, you know, because uh, his computer didn't, doesn't have a camera, so we had to have a camera on a computer set up in a different place. Um, and and the first day we did it one way, and we were like, oh yeah, that's not working, so we had to change it. So the first step is admitting, okay, that's not working with total abandon and not having it be accusatory and and not being like, duh, why did I not realize that this is not going to work? It's just like, oh, okay, this isn't working. No harm, no foul. What will we do differently? So I'm asking you this week, if it was just you and I, privacy moment, nobody's going to tell on anybody what's not working in your life. Um, And you can start with that question that we asked today about what's the hardest part of your day, because I guarantee you there's something that isn't working about that hardest part of your day. And I know from experience, like that whole situation with my son in the car, I was like, he has autism. So he is just not understanding that there's cars and that there's danger and that he's got to get out quicker. And I was blaming it all on that. And then lo and behold, the therapist came and they were like, you need to organize your crap. And you need to think this through and do this in a different way. It had nothing to do with him and everything to do with me. So we got to be humble and go, okay, maybe what I'm doing isn't the right way to go about it. It doesn't make me wrong, um, but we can do something better. Okay, we're, we're wasting Bonnie time. Uh, so we, uh, we got a big show for you right now. We've, we're welcoming Bonnie Yates um, to the show. I think she's there. Is she? I don't see her actually, Draven. Is she in the waiting room? Um, Bonnie Yates is a special education attorney and um, she works with the Tolner Law Offices and she is supposedly going to be here with us if she can do the math on the time. And (laughs) she's going to be talking with us about, uh, we started this topic two weeks ago about how sometimes schools are retaliatory and they will turn families into uh, child protective services as a, an intimidation. I mean, you know, sometimes schools do that because it's necessary, but we do, we're aware of times that schools have done this as an intimidation tactic to try to get families to stand down. Um, you know, if you're, uh, I was certainly worried about that and thought that that had happened to me. Um, when, when my son was three here in California, the school district, um, meets with you right before your child's third birthday to talk to you about what your child will be doing in school. And they offer you early services from the age of three. And that first woman, I was so excited because we had not yet started ABA and I, I like wanted to get anything going. You know, I was so desperate. And um, she came and she visited with us and she met my son and, and um, we had already gotten a diagnosis of autism on our own. We had just done it privately. We, and we were in the process of going, getting the secondary diagnosis through the regional center here in California. And so this really sweet woman, I just, you know, she was just one of those lovely sort of, you know, like an aunt figure came and sat on my couch and, you know, I made her a cup of herbal tea and she had all this paperwork and she was talking to me about my child with my child in the room. And, um, and she said, you know, have you gotten a diagnosis? And I said, yes, we got a diagnosis of autism. And she said, oh, what a relief. And I said, well, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Why, why do you say that? And she said, well, because we only have seven categories where we can allow children to start services at three. And she started going down the list. And, and she said, and if your child doesn't um, qualify under any of these, then what we do is we deem them And then she used the R word and, uh, and she said, and then we bring them And although she said MR, I don't even like to say the MR, you all know what I'm talking about, right? I don't want to say it here. Um, And so she said the R word and she said, so we would deem your child MR and that way he would have services. And I said, what? And I said, I don't think you're supposed to use that. Now, keep in mind, this is 15 years ago, right? And I said, I don't think you're supposed to use that word anymore. And she said, well, you know, that is in the state of California, that is still the word, that is the medical diagnosis, that is the word that we use. And shortly after that, they changed it um, to developmentally delayed and global delays and things of that such, but they were still saying it then. 
And I said, and you would be here and you would say that my child was MR. And she was like, oh yeah, that's how we get him services. And I just started to sob. I sat there and cried. Like I thought after he got the diagnosis of autism, you know, that like there was nothing you could say that was going to be able to have that big of an impact on me. But for whatever reason, it was like carpet pulled right out from under my feet. And I sat there and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And um, that's, you know, so she said to me, oh, don't worry, my dear, don't worry, because we're going to take him as soon as he turns three, he's going to start school services and we're going to have him for eight and a half hours a day. And it's all going to be so much better. And I was like, well, I, we want ABA. You're, are you doing ABA? And she said, oh, we do something like ABA, right? We're off to the races now. Like ABA. <laughs> I don't want like ABA. There's no study show, show that like ABA works. I want ABA, intensive one-to-one ABA. Do you do it or not? Oh, you'll have to look at the program, right? So we went and looked at the program and uh, it was horrible. They took us to this trailer at the end of a dirt road and there were kids in there that were beating their heads against a wall and they were letting them on an administrative walkthrough. So we said, you know, I said over my dead body, is my child going to this program, right? And, um, and we started to fight for funding for our child to get ABA at home. And, uh, you know, we have ABA started at home and we're fighting with the school district about this and there comes a knock at my door and I'd heard stories about them turning parents into CPS. And so I, it was a fear of mine. And so there's a knock at the door and it's a process server. And he, you know, slams the, he said, are you Shannon Penrod? Yes. He slams the papers down. He goes, you've been served. And, and it's like so vicious and my child is crying. And it was because the school district had filed due process against us. They sued us to prove that what they were offering in their crappy classroom was the thing that was right. And the wording of it in the beginning, I, I like, I was, you know, I'm, I didn't have a lawyer at that point, but I was calling lawyers because I didn't, they were saying that what we wanted to do with him was unethical and not in his best interest and that they wanted the court to rule that it was in his best interest to do what they said. And to me, that sounded like they were asking for custody of him. They weren't. And that was explained to me eventually, but I thought the top of my head was going to blow off. I have gone through it with other parents where child protective services um, contacted them and um, came to do a well check. And in one case where the child was taken away from the home for a period of time uh, because the school district had reported and said that they thought that they were, the child was being mistreated. So it's not a small thing. It's not a paranoid thing. Um, I don't think it happens as often as we're afraid as that happens, but does that matter? Because the people that that happens to, it's very, very, very scary. So Bonnie is going to talk with that, us about that at some point, but she does not appear to be here. Uh, so I am going to, in the interim, look at some of the things that you guys have said. And somebody wrote in and said that, oh, she is here. Okay. But I, I do want to get to the person worrying about their child wandering. There's Miss Bonnie. How yeah. are you? I'm good. Good morning. I've, I've missed morning. you. You look lovely. Thank uh, you. I was, I was telling them that about the fact that you were going to talk a little bit about um, school districts and retaliation. And, and I hadn't gotten to the fact that we hopefully are going to have a little chat about, we know more now than we knew two weeks ago about remote services, but we still don't know enough. But how, so tell us about Tolner Law Offices and give us the disclaimer and then chat with us. Hello. Tomer Law Offices is an eight attorney law firm based in San Jose, California with offices in Los Angeles and Irvine. And we do special education and disability discrimination and higher education and regional center stuff. And um, it's been an interesting several months. Um, okay, so wait, I just lost my place, sorry. So if you wanna, talk to us when you're in California, you can go to the Tolner Law Office's website, fill in a form and somebody will call you back within 24 hours and we can have a more focused conversation about what 
the concerns are, and I know there are plenty of concerns now, I would urge you guys to reach out and not just slide into doom and gloom about how there's nothing you can do. Um, if you're outside of California, we recommend you to COPA, the Council of Parent Advocates and Attorneys. They have an attorney list that's quite good. Um, and there's so much changing and so quickly, and there's kind of a big inefficiency in the way that um, one potentially approaches this because it's like taking somebody's temperature every 15 seconds. So I've sort of decided that I'm gonna balance out our calls in um, the sense that I don't just wanna talk about triage stuff and the here and now that might change again in four weeks. I just don't know. Um, so we're gonna do some of that, but we're also gonna continue to do what we did before, which was talk about issues of broad applicability for parents so that you're getting educated as you listen to this show so that you can better advocate for your child, which is the longer term goal of this program. So um, I'm sure most parents know that there are um, agencies that are charged with responsibility for protecting vulnerable elderly and um, incompetent adults and then also children. And for children, the agency in California is the Department of Children and Family Services. Um, it's a different agency for adults. Um, but after I started doing special ed for a while, I, I noticed that there was sometimes a nexus between a kid who had an IEP and a situation at school and the family being reported to the Department of Children and Family Services. Now, those agencies exist to protect children and they, they have an important role to play. And this is not supposed to be a critique of the need for and the fact of the existence of that agency. The problem is that people can abuse the system and that sometimes happens. And so specifically what I'm saying is um, there are people that are categorized as mandated reporters. And that means that if they observe what they suspect to be child abuse, they are responsible for reporting it. And that would include people like your behavior therapist or any related service provider. Um, it would also certainly include um, a teacher, potentially another parent, although parents aren't mandated reporters. If you're a mandated reporter like a teacher or a psychologist, if you don't report, you actually can be criminally liable. Um, so that's one way that the system um, ensures that bad situations get reported. The other thing about it is that the system offers those reporters, mandated reporters have absolute immunity from prosecution. So there's no way really, unless there are very egregious facts, there's no way for somebody to quote unquote, get in trouble for making a false report. Well, what has come to my attention and what is very concerning is that sometimes teachers report parents for IEP advocacy. And so they report them for something that parents are allowed to do, which is take um, strong positions at IEP meetings and, and sort of rather than having a face-to-face -face discussion with the parent and trying to get at what the issue is that is, is bothering the teacher so much, the teacher may go to DCFS and actually make a report and the teacher probably knows that the report is gonna be unfounded, but the teacher also knows that the parents are gonna go through a lot of stress about the possibility of having uh, their child removed from the home. So imagine being that parent who all of a sudden one night you're at home and you, you have a knock on, on the door and somebody comes in and he tells you that you've been reported for abuse and he's here to check it out. And you, um, he wants to interview each of you separately. So that would mean your child, your husband and, and, and yourself. Um, that in and of itself for any parent that understands that in dependency court, parents are um, stripped temporarily of their, of their rights um, to provide, you know, to be the custodial person for the child um, for an indefinite amount of time sometimes. Now there's different bases of reporting parents. It's not just abuse. Parents can also be reported for neglect. 
And neglect is a very interesting term because sometimes people have construed, people within DCFS have construed a particular type of medical treatment as abuse or neglect. And you know that should prick up everybody's attention because I know some of you um, use uh, alternative modalities in terms of treating your kids. And you may have doctors that espouse positions that aren't in keeping with let's say the mainstream medical community. And DCFS is very interested in making sure that if you are doing that kind of stuff, you have a conventional like family pediatrician who coordinates care and kind of keeps an eye on everything. And there's no legal requirement that, that you do that, but that's just something DCFS looks out for or watches for. Another thing that, that comes under this umbrella of stuff is uh, accusing the parent of essentially having Munchausen syndrome, which for those of you that don't know, means that uh, the person who's caring for the child gets some kind of um, gratification or a sense of self-importance from creating health problems for the child that don't exist. And they, they get attention and they get validation. And it's not to say that it isn't a legitimate syndrome, but it is to say that you can see how that kind of allegation, if used against a parent, would be very, very serious if it weren't true, and it would also be devastating for, for a parent. So I'm still in the process of kind of working my way through one of these cases, um, which the, the end result of which is now the district has come to me and said, write me a demand letter. But it didn't start out that way. It started out with a teacher who was unhappy because these parents, it wasn't even these parents, it was that these parents came in the wake of another set of parents who she felt had used up too much of her time in IEP meetings. And she basically was, you know, was heard to say, I'm not gonna let anybody do that to me again. Mm. So these parents, these parents had to step in and advocate for their child because the teacher was trying to transfer him out of her class without a, um, an IEP meeting. And we stopped that but that made the teacher mad. So the teacher reported the parents and the parents had to go through a DCFS investigation. So the first part of it was that somebody came to their home and interviewed all three of them separately and concluded that there wasn't enough evidence of abuse to remove the child from the home. The second part of this is that the DCFS scheduled an in-person meeting in their offices where the parents were interviewed by a social worker, an attorney, and a nurse for DCFS. And that's when I got in there and I could really see um, what the allegations were. And the third part of this was that, at, that the invest, okay, so the parents had to, in order to justify everything they had done to treat their child, they had to start when he was two and explain to these strangers his entire medical history and every upsetting thing that had ever happened. And um, the, the parents had really good documentation and they were quite polite, but there were points at which um, the mother broke down and cried in, in, in re-experiencing what had already happened and then sort of being victimized by this whole process. So the parents then waited for two months during which time, you know, they had their fingers crossed that nothing bad was going to happen. And in fact, nothing did. And they um, got a report after two months um, telling them that the charges were not um, substantiated. The part I didn't tell you, there's a couple of parts I didn't tell you. One is the teacher mentioned to a third party that she had reported them. And the third party um, repeated that to somebody else because she thought it was wrong. But the, the other things that can happen and didn't happen in this case are you can actually, uh, if, the, if the charges are uh, substantiated, you will end up with a case in um, family court or dependency court where you're basically trying to persuade the state not to take your child away from you and put your child into foster care. And the stakes are quite high and you will definitely have to hire an attorney and you may lose your child. And this for me was just, it was pretty shocking, 
that, that, that this teacher knew what was gonna happen and she did it anyway, because these are nice people. They're not difficult people. They, they give as good as they get, meaning if they ask you to do something, they're gonna put in their 100%, hold up their part of the bargain. Um, but I'm told, and there are, there are some articles that document this, that, that, that this is one way that parents are retaliated against for exercising their special education uh, ideas, let's just say, on behalf of their child. And why do I mention this? I mention this not because it's going to happen to you, but I, I just mention it because I think it's wrong. It's retaliatory. And I just want you guys to know, you know, what kind of stuff goes on out there because it's bad out there sometimes. And this was an instance of that. And, you know, a couple of things strike me, Bonnie. I mean, first of all, I get it that they're, you, you know, they can't be prosecuted um, for wrongly accusing or having an unsubstantiated claim. But could those parents now turn around and, and sue the school for uh, pain and suffering? Yes. Like a civil case? And it's so good. She's so good, you guys. There is no, there's no immunity for the school district. There is immunity for the teacher, um, but also the teacher. I think if the, it could be shown that the teacher knowingly made a false report, I think that that might be a situation in which she would be stripped of her immunity. But anyway, I mean, there was not a lot of love lo lost between the district and this teacher from what I understand. And she'd had problems for years and the union protected her. So, you know, guess who's gonna be left holding the bag? It's the district. Yeah. Um, but that's what happens if you, you know, the, this is a certain type of teacher and we got to be on the lookout for this person. They've been there a very long time. They're burned out. They often, they yell at the kids, even when outside observers are present in the classroom, they think they're untouchable. They sometimes are like running roughshod over the principal and they, you know, they need help. They need some kind of help. <laughs> Or, no, they need a new job is what they yeah, need. Yeah, that's you. But there's, a, there's a couple of things. I mean, obviously, it super bothers me that parents are going through this. But it also means that um, if, if this persists, then, then in, a, in a case where, you know, there really is abuse going on, it's possible that that will not be uh, looked at as seriously if teachers make these false claims. You know, it's like crying wolf. Um, but I, I, but I gotta say the thing it reminds me of, and I think you're the person who said this to me many, many years ago, is that if it looks like somebody doesn't want your kid in their class, don't mm -hmm. argue with them about it. Mm -hmm. Like have them be put in a different class. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I, I think well, it was, can I just say to that point, she wanted yeah. the kid out of her class, but there were 23 days left of school. And she thought mom and dad thought it'd be very traumatic for him to be transferred out of her class. But, I'm, but were there no other indications uh, before 23 days before the end of the oh, no, year? There were. there were other indications. I, the worst year that we had at school, the day before school started, we went to a meeting and um, with the teacher and the principal and the vice principal and sat there and the teacher was obnoxious and didn't want to hear what anybody had to say. And she was like, I've got this because she had mm -hmm. uh, nephews or nieces that were on the spectrum. She was like, I've got this. I, you know, everybody needs to, well, I don't understand why we have to be here for this meeting. And I was telling a friend about it and they said, get him out of that classroom right now, go back mm -hmm. and say, no, I want to be with, there was only two choices. And they said, get him in the other teacher. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, you know, I'm going to work it out. I'm mm -hmm. capable of working it out. And mm -hmm. Like, it's the biggest regret. I wished I had just said no, um, you know, because anybody who says no, I don't need to know anything is uncurious. They're unintelligent. They're a bad teacher. Mm -hmm. Like our kids have no place in there. Um, and I, so I just want to say that to parents, like, I, it, it's so hard. I'm a former teacher and I love teachers and there are good teachers, but there are some people who are fried or burnt or don't belong in the profession. And if you see any indication that your kid is with one of those kids, I'm all for moving them early. What do you think about that, Bonnie? Well, you're making me think back to when Nick was in second grade and he had a, he had a teacher like this who was, who'd been there for 25 years and she knew where all the bodies were buried and she had the principal, you know, on bended knee. 
And she um, basically made it very clear to me that she thought that it was impossible that he could be successfully included in first grade. And she made it very clear to me that she was hostile to the whole idea. And I'm asking myself now why I didn't ask for a teacher change. Was it because I didn't think I could? Was it because I thought the teacher would be, um, you know, the default teacher wouldn't be any better? But I remember when, when Nick went into third grade, you know, and this is a person with autism that's just learning to how to vocalize these things. He came home and he said to me about the third grade teacher, he said, mommy, she's a really nice teacher. And, you, and it breaks your heart and it breaks your heart permanently. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I can remember, I, I do think it was you, Bonnie, that said to me that when your school is doing their open house where you can go and see what, what projects your child was working on, you had said, go, go to that, but go shop all of the, the teachers for the next grade to see uh, you know, what, what they're like. And that saved him from a different year because there was one teacher that everybody was telling us, oh, you, you need to be with this teacher. You need to be with this teacher. And we went over during the open house and we introduced ourselves and we said, oh, you know, our child is, and we said his name and I know they're thinking about, and she was like, oh yeah. And I went, oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> that is your response. And then, you know, we went to another per person's class and they said, I know I'm not on the list, but I would love to have your kid in the oh, classroom. That's and that's where he went. And, and she was, that teacher was amazeballs. I mean, you know, I, I, I honestly think if somebody is not over the moon excited about your kid, somebody else will be. Well, I, I want to say, since I probably have a reputation for maybe not saying enough good stuff about teachers, and I'm married to one, but um, that his kindergarten teacher was amazing. His first grade teacher was amazing. His third grade teacher was amazing. His fourth grade teacher was amazing. And his fifth grade teacher, who was a really lovely woman, basically said to me, like, I don't think you need to worry about this so much anymore. Like, he's clearly going to be able to be mainstreamed in middle school, you know? So, I mean, that was one in one in six teachers. But a person like that can do a lot of damage to a child. And I, I do think, you know, that there are self-esteem issues that, that, that we all have from being reprimanded in class, you know, and, and feeling shamed. Um, so... Or just somebody not advocating for you when another person says something. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I go into classrooms sometimes because I'll, I'll go in to work on a project. I, you know, I used to teach theater. So I'll go in and do a, like a one day thing with uh, grade school kids. And it's always amazing to me. I can tell how good the teacher is because if a child says something negative to another child, I don't ever let that go. Mm -hmm. I go, whoa, let's stop everything. Mm -hmm. What just happened there? And we talk it out. But I'm amazed at how many teachers let that slide. And that's not good for our kids either. Mm -hmm. But I know some teachers that are amazing. Yeah, really it's, a gift. it's a gift yeah. of, of, of birth. Um, so apropos teachers, do we have six more minutes? We do. Okay. So here's what I want to say about school closure. Continuing yeah. through. Uh, obviously, it's district by district, state by state. And if you're in a um, locality where there's going to be a hybrid model or schools are going to be open, we can address what that'll look like via questions if you want to send questions in. For those of you who are in um, a district that's that you know you're told are not going to be opening in the fall, what I want to do, um, when we're together next, is I wanna talk about what your alternatives are that would be better than what you had during the last semester. Because, um, it, it, you know, I think the way we approach distance learning from March to June was, this is a standalone period. It's, you know, short in duration. Everybody's gonna get back on the horse and ride. And now we really do have to worry about the longer term academic and, um, you know, uh, emotional effects of, of not being in school for children. And there are, there are some other options. Um, and one really outside of the box option 
that came up last week is, you know, if you had two or three families and you pooled your resources, potentially you could hire a teacher who would run a little one room schoolhouse in your house if you could figure out how to do that help wise. Another thing is if you're not in that position, then what you should be doing is you should be looking at your distance learning plan that you've got versus what you were supposed to get. And you should be scheduling an IEP meeting with the district so that you can have a meeting in the first 30 days of September so that you can make your district do more than they did during school closure. And you know, I, I didn't send this to you, Shannon, I sent it to my office, but there was an article over the weekend in the New York Times about private schools doing more than public schools, having more resources and doing more in response to COVID than public schools. And I do have to say that the students that I know who were in distance learning programs during school closure, who are privately placed private school students in every case got something that looked a lot more like a robust six hour day. So it's not that it cannot be done. And it, and you know, I can't assure you that it's gonna be done for everyone, but I can, you know, give you, I think some measure of confidence that if you, ask your district to provide this, they're gonna to have to come up with a pretty good reason for why they can't do anything more than they've been doing. And we really need to start focusing on how you create a robust school in your home if you don't have one and your school's yeah. not real. Yeah, and I, I wanna say, um, I, I personally have had some like, uh, about things that have happened um, in the, in the last few months with school. And I had to sit myself down and go, okay, there's that. Um, but I gotta, I gotta be looking at the fall and, mm -hmm. and I, 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 it's not that I can't carry what happened in the spring into the fall. I gotta let go of the resentment about being right. Mm -hmm. uh, and just get what my child needs. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that lovingly to everybody. Cause I've had to say it lovingly to myself is like, you know, I, I think it's always important, and we call this your rights with you here, that we, we know what our rights are. But once you know what your rights are, then, then I think it becomes a dance of, okay, knowing that, how do I get what my child needs? Which is, you know, sometimes, I mean, it, sh it should just be about the legal things, but school doesn't respond to that sometimes. Um, we've got a couple no. of comments here really quick. As a teacher, yeah, I want to learn... Uh, somebody wrote in and said, as a teacher, I want to learn all that I can about the children that I'm working with. Parents, guardians are one of the best sources of information about our kiddos. You're a great teacher. And we love yeah. that. Somebody else said, I show up at IEP meetings with my son's report to show teachers what my son's life is like outside of school, including behaviors mm -hmm. we see at home. It gives them a lot of insight. And I've got a, I, I've had a lot of positive feedback about it. I think that's awesome too. Yeah, well, it's clear that expectations play a huge part in what somebody can um, elicit from a child. And I was always amazed that, you know, no matter the extent of the disability, most kids that I saw with autism um, could figure out when somebody was angry and didn't like them. Yeah, yeah, isn't so, that the uh, truth? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. But then, so next week we can dig in to some of this okay. um, and and start to figure out what to do. But in the meantime, send your questions, uh, send your questions people. Yeah. So that we We'd can like specific. And react to them and get you some yeah. more information. And in the meantime, though, if Bonnie, like for instance, if somebody feels that they've had the school district retaliate against them, where if they're in the state of California, obviously they should come to you. Uh, at the Tolner Law Offices, um, you guys can Google Tolner, T O. it's two L's, isn't it? Yeah, it is. T-O-L-L-N-E-R uh -huh. -E Law Offices, and you'll find Bonnie there. And if they're not in the state of California, is that the copa.net site? It is. And you, it is. And you know, there are federal laws, uh, Section 504 um, has an anti-retaliation provision, and so does the California Education Code, and I'll try to supply that for you to, to disseminate. So there is specific protection in the IDEA for parents who want to advocate for their children and, and, the, and the notion is they should be able to do so, whether you agree with them or not, without fear of retaliation. 
Amen to that. If you, well, if you retaliate against a parent, the long-term net effect is going to be that parent's going to be afraid to participate at the next IEP meeting. Yeah. Or, and we or have that right. Needs. Yeah. So. Well, Bonnie, we always appreciate you. We will see you back next week. And again, if people have questions, uh, get them over to us. Um, we're happy to answer questions. We like to get them early before the day of the show. So Bonnie has a chance to review them. So um, you can send those directly to me at s.penrod at autism-live.com. Uh, Bonnie, thank you so much for being with us as always. And we will welcome you back next week. All right. See everybody then. Take care. Right, take care. Bye-bye. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, say to you guys, we're having a big week this week. Um, I'm late getting the postcard out because we were off last week, but postcard forthcoming soon soon, soon, soon. But one of the things I really don't want you to miss on Friday, we're having Kathy Gott on, and she's going to be talking about a new place called The Village, which I think everybody is going to find really interesting. Uh, and we have Evelyn Kung on Wednesday answering your questions. All right. Uh, and I believe that we're having um, some of some clips of Temple Grandin tomorrow. I cannot I cannot do that for sure. But anyway, thrilled to be back, you guys. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.